when we came to Canada for the first time in 2009, I remember that I could go to a big store and then just uh, for $100, I could fill the whole cart, full cart of groceries. Almost overfilling it, probably. Yeah, overfilling it. Out of the cart. Yeah, exactly. The groceries will, will fall off the cart for 400 bucks. Now I can only, you know, cover the bottom for 100 bucks, right? So this tells me much more about inflation than anything else. I can feel it. I can feel that I can't really buy as much as I did uh, 13 years ago. So you're pissed off about inflation going up because you can't control any of it. It's driving you nuts. You're seeing it in the headlines. You're watching YouTube clips and you're seeing it on the Tic Tacs and the tweeters and the and the Instagrammies and all the things out there about how inflation is kicking us in the nuts, uh, proverbial nuts, that is. Uh, it would be pretty amazing if, in, if inflation was a physical person that could kick you in the nuts. But you're tired of it and you want to know what you can do about this and you know how can you protect yourself to some degree. Well, we're not going to have all the answers, but I'm here with my friend Roman today and we're going to talk a little bit about what has happened in the past and we're going to talk about a real world example of our mentor, R. Nelson Nash, and one of the stories he used to relate and share to us about how inflation showed up over his years in, in on planet Earth. Now, Nelson, he lived to uh, the ripe age of 88. He would say 88 revolutions around the sun. Uh, that's how he would describe it. And in that time frame, he experienced so much. You know, he was born in the 30s. He lived through the Second World War, uh, amongst many other you know wars that followed. In that whole time frame, he experienced all kinds of ups and downs, and ups and downs, and hills and valleys, and mountains of financial good and a lot of financial bad. And so he had a huge level and breadth of experience to speak about what was consistent in his life and how he saw inflation play a role as he lived his life. So I think Roman, you know, we, I'm glad I'm talking to you about this today because you also have a lot of unique perspective uh, to bring. And you and I've had a few conversations in the past about, you know, your journey coming to Canada and your your past living over in Europe and how you saw things happen in the financial system there, mm -hmm. and the, the concern maybe that especially folks you know who are who immigrated to Canada find maybe their perspective on things like inflation is a little different because they've had a different experience than most living Canadians today. And I'm excited to have this conversation with you. Yeah, thank you so much, Richard. You know, inflation was one of my biggest fears when I came to Canada, because when I experienced inflation back in my country, we just had the same inflation, the same thing with just more zeros attached to it, right? It's pretty much, uh, it works the same way. So the a currency is depreciating in its value, losing its purchasing power every day or every year. And uh, the citizens just have to deal with it. They have to embrace it, have to accept it because all the, like when you wake up and then all the goods and services uh, went up in, in, in price, you just need to do something with it. And then, so people are actually looking to hedge the, the capital against it, right? Somehow you need to find a way to either overpace inflation with uh, something that is growing better than inflation or do something else, right? In the country where I lived, you know, one of the hedges was uh, US dollar, right? So US dollar, we, we would just buy your US currency and then keep it in cash or keep it in a bank account. This was our hedge, but guess what? US dollar also has its own inflation, right? US inflation. and. Uh, there's no real protection from inflation. We're just going from one currency to another currency, from one zone to another another inflation zone. So, and uh, yeah, we, we just wanted to talk today about inflation and how the policyholders, how the Canadians can make sure that we protect our capital from inflation. Yeah, and the, the idea is to try to give yourself every chance or opportunity to have a hedge. And there are multiple ways that you might be able to do that. And for some people watching, you've probably already taken some of those steps, you know, and, and, and good for you on that. You know, Roman and I, you, we had another video that we did uh, a little while back and we talked a little bit about, you know, silver and gold to a degree yeah. and that being a, a bit of a hedge. And a lot of people believe that that's the case, but again, the purpose of doing that is, isn't so much a matter of, uh, you know, as, as an example, I go and get silver coins and then I have a stack of those, you know, in a little sleeve of silver coins and I'm sitting on them. They're just sitting there and they're doing nothing. They're just sitting in a safe essentially. 
the idea is okay at some point in time if we if we really start to see uh you know a really big economic type collapse scenario whatever that is in, in your mm -hmm. geographic area so so us in canada and maybe it'll happen it'll start happening in different places and and so you have a little bit of a something to that's physical that if you needed goods and services you are more likely to be able to now negotiate or or have a, a conversation with a vendor a supplier a business owner about hey i, I need your service I know that you don't want to take my pink Canadian money today because for whatever reason it's you know it's been manipulated too much and it's no longer worth its value. So this you're not going to accept this hundred dollar or fifty dollar bill, but will you accept one of these silver coins in, in exchange instead? And then there's that physical, tangible nature. And so now you're in kind of this you're almost like a back to a barter system. Ultimately, everything we do is a barter yeah. system. We're just using the currency denomination to add speed to that barter mm -hmm. aspect. And, and we don't need to barter with though, you know, like when I ordered something on Amazon today, I didn't have to barter with Jeff Bezos to get you know, the delivery to my door. I didn't have to barter the delivery guy to just show up magically and leave it on my front doorstep. So we, we've, we've been able to utilize the currency method and, and, and computer technology to add, you know, lightning speed onto trans transaction activity where I can now buy from anyone in the world without having to really physically speak to someone or go and negotiate with that individual. But ultimately what we're doing is the same thing. It's just, it's just happening on this mass scale now. And so when the, when the value of the currency comes down and, or it's a combination of, you know, value of currency comes down or price of goods go up, it, it, they're really the same thing that's taking place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And where you, where you see that happen is often in, in specific areas. So like, you know, people would talk about certain staples that you put in your fridge, you know, you buy groceries. Okay. Well, the price of fruit went up or the price of milk went up and, and there could be a higher degree of price change. Like, let's say I want to buy a gallon of milk, you know, yesterday and it's four bucks. And today I want to go do it. It's $7. Well, that's a pretty dramatic increase in that one, one spot. I might not see the same increase on, let's say a can of peas. Okay, yeah. so the, so there's a variable there, and that has to do with supply chain dynamics and supply and demand. Now, I'll give you an, I'll give you a direct example of this. So, where I live in Chilliwack, I, I love it here. It's fantastic. Chilliwack, BC, is a, a beautiful, wonderful place. And uh, one thing I really love about it is <clears throat> something that's like reminds me of growing up. So, growing up in Alberta in a small town in the Alberta area, we used to literally just drive down the road to a neighbor's house, and we used to get our milk there. Mm -hmm. We would just go get a jar of milk. I remember, like, I we would separate the cream off and. That's how we got our milk. We didn't go to the store to get it when I was when I was a, a young boy, and it was fantastic up until the point where it didn't. It just wasn't sensible to do that anymore because sometimes it was a, the timing didn't work out. Now today in Chilliwack, I can actually go and do that in in local places. There's a there's a place. It's about maybe six seven minutes down the road. They actually have a vending machine where I can go and I can bring my own jug and I can basically get milk right out of the jug and I can put like loonies into it. So that's kind of cool. Nice. But also one of the things that we do is we buy a lot of local produce and, and things like eggs. Mm -hmm. So I can walk down the road. I can take my dog and go for a walk. And it's about a five minute walk, six minutes. Mm -hmm. And I can, I can literally drop money in a little box, an honesty box, you know, yeah. that's a $7 and I can get a dozen eggs and I can walk home with them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's pretty cool because I'm, I'm happy that I don't have to pay uh, the GST <laughs> government slavery tax. Um, and, and some other things. And I get to give my money directly to the farmer who made those eggs and, and did all that stuff. I'm really happy about that. Now, what's interesting, though, is about, say, six months ago, roughly, maybe maybe seven months ago, those same dozen of eggs were about four bucks or four fifty. So the increase on 12 eggs has gone up pretty substantially. Now, I know the reason for that or part of the reason for that is because the the farmer, that local farmer, they've had a dramatic increase in chicken feed. Yep. So the, the cost to feed the chickens is now pushing the price up on the consumer because they, they can't keep their chickens. They can't feed them unless they do that. They have to. So again, it goes back to the situation of the consumer. The consumer pays for everything. So we are always, as a consumer, for everything we do in life, we're paying the top level price that has to happen. That's absorbing all the supply chain problems and costs and, and all the manipulation of money supply that, that governments and central banks are doing and shenanigans that are happening on a global basis. 
we are paying that price. So goods are getting exported from another country, whether it's, you know, China or wherever, and it comes to, to our shores, well, you got to pay for that. And then there's import fees and duties on the, that stuff that comes into the country. That's yep. a tax. That tax gets added to the price. Then it goes to the wholesaler. The wholesaler has to send it to the retailer. There's a, they have to get a profit that that gets added in. And then mm -hmm. it's like, it just levels up and levels up and levels up. And then we pay the price. And then on top of that price that the business needs so that they can try to earn a profit or keep their employees employed, mm -hmm. then we have to pay tax on top of yeah. that price. So the, these combination of factors really amplify the inflation problem because we see it at the consumer level, at the daily goods that we buy. We're seeing the valuation of the dollar, or in other words, what our dollar can purchase is going down. I'm going to give you one more example. Sorry, I'm on a soapbox a little bit here, Roman. And now, I don't know when you were growing up if you had vending machines that you could go buy mm -hmm. like, yes. like soda or pop or like Coke and that sort of thing. Yep. Now, when you would used to go to a vending machine you could go put in a certain amount of money and you could get a Coke. And I remember it being, you know, I could, you, there was places I could go, like I could go to the hockey where you can get it for like 50 cents. It wasn't Coke. It was like RC Cola. It was a, it was a knockoff. Maybe it was 75 cents for a Coke. And then it went up to a dollar. And now, and it was there for a really long time, as far as I remember. In fact, I used to, at, at my local school, I used to be the guy that filled the vending machine and I had mm -hmm. to take, you know, collect the coins and, and all that sort of thing. And then I remember as I age, okay, now it's a dollar twenty-five. Then it's a dollar fifty. Now it's two bucks. Now you want to go and buy one, and you go to the airport and buy one. It's like three dollars for the pretty much the equivalent Coke. It's not in a can anymore. It's in a bottle. Maybe there's a little bit more volume, of, but you're paying like three dollars for that. Sometimes more. So that's a pretty dramatic difference in a let's call it a thirty-year time frame. And I'm curious, what was your experience? growing up where you were when you would do something similar. Like I said, yeah, so we had inflation on a different scale and uh, normally the inflation was not lower than 10% in the countries where I lived. It was uh, really, you know, hard to keep up with inflation sometimes, especially I've seen inflation at, you know, 100%, even 200%, even more, right? So it's really hard to, to um, you know, describe how we would feel about that, but uh, the prices would just double in, in a month period or in, in, in several month period, and then they will double again, and then they will double again in, in a year or two. So the inflation really was a big factor when I lived, you know. I remember the prices when we lived in still in, in USSR, right? In USSR times when we, we could buy like a, some groceries, let's say like a big sausage for, I guess, 84 sense and then after this ussr collapsed after the you know there was russia ukraine the prices just went up like crazy like uh we had like so big inflation because of bad economy bad you know management because of bad government and uh everything just quadrupled in in, in just overnight in in the price just to give you an idea of what the inflation looks like when we look back, I'm going to be talking about Canada, not about Russia or Ukraine. So where I live, I live in Steinbeck, uh, Manitoba. So, and we have something called a, a Mennonite Heritage Museum here in Steinbeck, which is a museum of, you know, how the first settlers came to Steinbeck from Germany, how they started, you know, living. And there's like a small shop with uh, still prices on, on the wall for how much you can buy food for, right? Like a, you can buy like a, a cup of tea for like 24, 24 cents, right? So when I go back to that store, it always reminds me of inflation, of how the inflation works throughout the years. You may not notice inflation in the, what it was in, in the last month or year. It may not be that significant. But when you look back for centuries, you will see that inflation created a huge problem where the money devaluated in like many, many, many times. And uh, for example, when we came to Canada for the first time in 2009, I remember that I could go to a big store and then just uh, for $100, I could fill the whole cart, full cart of groceries. Almost overfilling it probably. Yeah, overfilling it, it, out of the cart. Yeah, exactly. The groceries will, will fall off the cart for 400 bucks. Now I can only, you know, cover the bottom. 400 bucks, right? So this tells me much more about inflation than anything else. I can feel it. I can feel that I can't really buy as much as I did uh, 13 years ago. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the real world example. And I would imagine 
people, you know, they're experiencing that in, in many ways. And it's, it's interesting when you start to think about like the individual products or you want to really start to kind of grasp how inflation is showing up in your life specifically. Yeah. Think about specific things. I think the grocery store is a really good spot because that's, it's a fundamental need. We need food on our table. We have to feed our family. And so this is an area where, the, where we really get squeezed a lot. And there's many reasons that cause fluctuation in, in food prices. A lot of it, a lot of it has to do with the supply and demand and the supply chain has been because of the whole COVID scenario, supply chain has been really, really, um, uh, you know, hit hard in many areas. You know, we saw it in a huge spikes in like lumber prices and construction materials for the same reason. And another thing that has, has impacted that of course, in the supply chain is fuel. So, you're noticing it at when you go to the pump to put, you know, put petrol and gas mm -hmm. into your, into your tank of your vehicle. But think about now the trucker or the truck driver that's, that's delivering those goods and they have to fuel up. Well, whether they are a private truck driver or they work for a large company, that's, a, you know, that's, that's what they do as a large organization. So they have that huge amplified cost, which means yeah. they must charge more for their delivery services. There is no other option or they're going to go out of business. And then yeah, all right. those employees are going to be unemployed. Like it's a huge ripple effect. Exactly. So, and, and all the businesses need to raise prices now because everything is tied on delivery, tied on transportation. Transportation is a blood of economy. When the gas prices go up, guess what? Everything will go up eventually. Not just, not just uh, groceries. It, I mean, all the prices and all the services of building, uh, you know, building materials and uh, everything, literally everything will go up. You know, I've never seen someone riding a pedal bike, hauling a giant trailer behind them filled with all the stuff that shows up at a Canadian Tire or a Home Depot. You know, that that's not how that stuff's getting to the store. Yep. <laughs> it's getting there on a truck. Okay, the fuel prices are going, okay, well, what is that? Okay, well, there's there's obviously pricing in the actual cost of mm -hmm. oil, what's a barrel of oil, one of those kind of things. But then it's also, where is that oil coming from? And then, it, and then further to that, it's what is the tax on getting it in there? And then what is the surcharges and the fuel taxes and all those kind of things? And then, you know, now we also have, and again, not to make, I'm just thinking about what are the things that are driving things up? And so then there's also now a carbon tax that's added and that's going to be escalating over the next number of years, uh, you know, based on the current plans of the government in Canada. And so it's a tax on a tax on a tax, but it adds a little, it adds another layer. And that's a layer that's chipping away at your money. And it's making you have to work harder or trying to do whatever you can to try and increase your income and your revenues so you can keep pace. Now, thinking about, you know, uh, income and revenues when, you know, we're going to talk a little about Nelson and what are the things that Nelson experienced when over his, you know, history on 88 years on the earth. And when he was talking about when he first started working and he was married as a very young man, he was in his, you know, uh, late twenties and he was working, uh, at the, uh, I'm trying to remember. It was like a, a National Guard uh, kind of a situation. He was making about ten thousand dollars a year, and he said that at that time that was better than the average bear. In other words, he was making a very good income at that point, and this is back in like 1959. Ten thousand dollars is U.S. A, a year, and now today the average person or middle class, average Canadian, maybe upper middle class, they're earning you know somewhere around eighty to a hundred thousand dollars a year. You know, in in general. Now, because of the cost and the, the pricing of everything, a lot of households, they're also now need to be, they require to be a dual income household yep. in order to have enough revenue coming in that they can support all the stuff that's going on. So, so again, that's a big change. Now the incomes have gone up. If we were to look at, you know, Nelson in 1959 at, at 10 grand, and let's just, just, you know, take the Canada U S dollar out of the situation and we shoot forward today where let's just say the average income is about a hundred thousand and I'm, I'm, I don't know those numbers. I'm just using it as a barometer here. Then we're 10 times greater on the income. So incomes have gone up, but has how is that related to all the other formats where we where we're where we're paying? So if you think about the cost of a vehicle, the cost of the fuel, the cost of the insurance, the cost of the housing, the cost of the this, the cost of that. Like it used to be you could buy a vehicle for like two thousand dollars, and that mm -hmm. would be the the brand new vehicle. And yeah, that was a large portion of the $10,000 of income, but you would have it paid for in like two or three years. And now, but that vehicle wouldn't last as long because they didn't have the quality of materials and knowledge and construction and, and engineering that we have today. But 
you know, everything has a relevance point. And so, yes, incomes have gone up from at least Nelson's story of 1959, but have they gone up to keep pace with the inflation and and the rapid inflation that we're seeing, which my belief is, and, you know, I did just did a video recently uh, with our friend Henry on this talking about the Bank of Canada and some of the manipulation of interest rates and money supply and that sort of stuff. There's underlying factors that have happened and all those factors are already history. In other words, they've already taken place. They took place one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years ago in a combination of events that's led up to the problem that we're now dealing with. So these yeah. are these are things that happen that have an unintended consequence. We, as a Canadian citizenship, as a population, we're dealing with the unintended consequence presently. Yeah. Exactly. And whatever is going to be done, so this is really important. I want people to think about this. Whatever is going to be done by the top level people. So mm -hmm. we'll just we'll just put a blanket statement on. We'll say we'll say government, and maybe it's Bank of Canada, maybe it's this. There's a this the top layer of who's going to make decisions about this problem. That solution, quote unquote, solution that they create, you know, it's also going to have an unintended consequence. So just keep that in mind because there's this thing called the business cycle that Austrian economists talk about. You can learn a lot about that by, you know, a great book to get is uh, Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. And if you understand a little bit about the Austrian mindset of economics and the business cycle, the boom bust cycle that is created has a huge amount to do with the manipulation of interest rates and the fractional reserve system and the manipulation of the money supply. And we're seeing that in massive quantities. And especially because of the aftermath of COVID, the amount of money that has been manufactured or, or, or added into effectively circulation by the, the federal government and, and et cetera, is we, we don't know how that problem is really going to show up. I mean, we can, we can make assumptions, we can use some logic to think it through, but we're not even seeing the real impact of that problem now. We're starting to see a portion of it, but I don't think we're going to see the real impact for, for a while yet. I don't know, Roman, I, I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely, Richard. Uh, I totally agree with uh, what you said. And uh, also, I wanted to mention that inflation is not a huge problem if it is going both ways. On, on one end, there's an income uh, coming to the family, and then there's expenses. So money flowing in, money flowing out. The biggest problem with inflation is that it only affects the expenses side most of times, right? So because think about it, when when the price of goods and expenses and especially gas and, you know, groceries and the bills, um, everything goes up, then it affects your cash flow. Because if you have uh, some some sort of discretionary income, let's say your income is uh, 50K, and then your expenses are, let's say, 44K, right? Including taxes, including mortgage and groceries and everything. And your discretionary income is about 6K, which is five, $500 per, per month, right? So when inflation hits, what happens is that the expenses go up. Ex expenses go up and then it shrinks your ability to save, shrinks your ability to grow your, your capital because the income doesn't go up automatically in value, right? So you don't really automatically get a raise at work when, when the prices go up. Do you? You probably don't, right? Normally, uh, citizens get, you know, income raise from time to time, but does it keep up with inflation? Richard, what do, what do you think? Well, I think that, um, you know, I know everyone's enjoying this conversation, Roman, and really we're going to encourage everyone to watch the rest of this conversation. All you got to do is head on over to the Banker's Vault channel right now.